Heartfire by Rose Mackey, Book One of Under Violet Suns. Chapter Seven, Day One. Encrypted Transmission Security Command to Agent Agrento. Agrento text. The maman has taken ill. Request advice. End transmission. Security Command response. The maman is classified a high priority target. Removal significantly increases the operation's probability of success. Remove target. End transmission. Agrento text. Confirmed. I will attempt to infiltrate the medical bay and remove her. End transmission. Colony-class ships like the Ardrak were so popular because of their ease of use. By breaking down into habitation modules, the colonists had ready-made housing, each pod with its own generator and life support system sufficient to run for several months. In the two years of planning for the colony, every department had been given a detailed schedule for landing and their respective heads sprang into smooth efficiency, calling for their personnel to join them in the pods assigned to each area. The combined defence, survival and internal security team's first task was to establish perimeter security. They split up into smaller groups, each taking a small mobile hoverbike, and rode to their assigned targets in various locations to set the GPS markers. Once at the assigned points, they were to use a mag shutter to drive a perimeter node deep beneath the surface. When all nodes were in place, the engineering teams would fire up the perimeter power rig, which they had been setting up in parallel as their initial priority. At least that was the plan. It became immediately apparent that the perimeter surveys were not entirely useful. The surveys are complete shit, sir, Tarlac reported to Lucius and Gadek Rattan through the comm. Lucius squinted at the HUD display in his office. Define complete shit. Well, I am standing about half a scree away from where I am meant to insert the node. Except it's not there. What's not there? The ground. Tarlac turned on his HUD viewer and spun it around, showing himself standing on the edge of a cliff on the valley side. Lucius rubbed his forehead. OK, clearly the surveying team was incompetent. We'll contact the ship and get them to rerun the perimeter scans and send them a strongly worded comm later. Tarlac cut him off. Actually, sir, I think it's more than that. Look at my sensor readings. Tarlac streamed them his analysis, which showed that according to the sensors, there was indeed another half-scree of land before the edge. I think there is something in the land around here that make the sensors inaccurate. Lucius ground his teeth. Noted. Move to the next target. The net was designed with redundancy in mind to be able to withstand attack. It will be fine without a node or two. You can take... Sreya motioned to Lucius to pause the comm for a moment. Hold a moment, Tarlac. He paused the transmission. What is it? Sreya's eyes were distant for a moment as she received another HUD report, before snapping back to Lucius. I've got Beta Team comming in the same issue. There is a waterfall in the way of their node. Lucius's HUD flashed with an alert from Gamma Team, and he raised an eyebrow at Sreya as he acknowledged the call. Gamma Team needs to talk. Three guesses what the issue is. Sreya snickered turning to the projected map of the planned perimeter network floating over the large work table. She studied the topography, considering the potential options. I suggest that we go old-fashioned and abandon mag shutter positioning for now. How so? If we get enough of the mag shutter nodes misaligned or offline, we risk the whole perimeter destabilizing. It is a significant security risk that could be easily exploited. Who knows what other issues there were with the scans? We use manual site laser measuring, We'll only be able to go 15 scree out, not 30 as planned. We don't have strong enough lasers for any further, and we'll need to calculate the field strength manually, but it'll get it done. Lucius nodded. It was the best solution given their situation, and activated an all-teams channel. All security teams, return to base for collection of new equipment. Sreya turned away to mutter into her own HUD before turning back to him. I've requested an engineer to come over to help us calculate the field strength and distance, I will inform the KDEC to be wary of any other scans that have been done. Until we know what has caused the interference, we can't compensate for it, so we'll need to post manual guards and undertake physical scans. They both sighed. Everyone would be pulling double shifts until this was resolved. Belatedly, Lucius had another thought. I'll get a science team onto the survey analysis. We need to find out why our surveys are inaccurate. Something in the environment must be causing the distortion. Dinara stared at Odrin as he listed off the missing medical supplies, feeling her ire rising. She had tasked him overseeing the setup of the medical regeneration labs, and he had been dragging his feet. 
Eventually, he had revealed to her that he could not complete the setup. What do you mean we don't have any more catalyst or skew skin? We are on an alien planet. There will be medical injuries and you are telling me that we don't have the ability to code and create antivenin or grow replacement skin and organs. Odrin took a prudent step back in the face of her anger. Yes, Chief Healer. And you were going to tell me this when? Um, um, what, Odrin? When I was in the middle of an emergency and someone's life was in the balance. This is unacceptable. How could the logistics area have screwed up so badly? This has placed us all in danger. Odrin took another careful step further back. Chief Healer, Lucius was tasked with reporting any missing supplies to the Kadec. I was ordered to keep it confidential. Dinara's breath caught in her throat, a kernel of hurt forming. It was absurd. She barely knew Lucius and he barely knew her. She had no reason to expect him to share with her, but it still hurt. Lucius told you to keep it secret, even from me in my own medbay. Odrin nodded miserably. Dinara paced in agitation. Odrin's revelation. It certainly shed a new light on Lucius undertaking a stock take. If the cadet suspected something was wrong and requested any missing items to be kept confidential, she must be worried about something. Still, not informing the chief healer of missing supplies was a recipe for disaster. The risk to health response overrode any political machination. Dinara activated a priority channel on her HUD. Kadek, I need to report missing medical supplies. The Kadek's cool voice spoke in her ear. I'm aware, Dinara. Dinara was undeterred. My capability to respond to medical emergencies is severely compromised. I do not appreciate being kept in the dark. The Kadek's response was clipped. Please elaborate. I cannot generate antivenin or custom antiparasitics, nor can I create new skin grafts, organs or custom blood products. I have enough painkillers and normal medical supplies for six months, maybe less, and a single vial of catalyst remaining. It was in our medical emergency kit, not shipped with the rest of the supplies. We had better hope that we don't encounter anything that requires a custom build treatment. Anything beyond basic cuts, bruises and broken bones will be challenging. Thank you for your report, Healer. Your advice is noted. I'm not finished, Kadek. I recommend that we prioritise tasking scientific teams investigating the local flora for plants that may have medicinal properties. With your permission, I will set up a team. Morale huffed a laugh. Very well, Dinara. Approved. Dinara was not appeased. You should also know I used a lot of our medication on hand treating the mammal. If I had known it was missing, I would not have commenced her treatment. I would have had her placed in stasis and shipped to a specialist medical station. Dinara worked to control her snapping tone. Roaring her frustration at the colony's governor would not resolve the situation. Completing her treatment will exhaust the last vial of catalyst. I request instructions. There was a pause as the cadet considered. Complete the treatment. We will deal with any other situations as they emerge. Dinara resisted the urge to grind her teeth in frustration at being stonewalled. Cadet, do you know what happened to our supplies? Not yet. We are investigating. Please keep this confidential. Dinara blew out a breath, her gaze scanning the room as if she could materialise the missing supplies by will alone. Eventually she swallowed her pride and anger. It was not the Kadek's fault. Thank you, Kadek. Dinara ended the comm and turned to Odrin. You have work to do, Odrin. Your bioengineering skills are about to become very much in demand. I want you to pull up the preliminary analysis scans of the local flora and fauna and tag any that were identified as having medicinal potential. Odrin nodded, clearly relieved to escape unscathed. I am going to commence the process to wake up the mammal and prep her last treatment. The process to remove the mammal from stasis, complete her treatment and raise her from her coma took several days. During that time, the medbay was plagued with minor injuries that kept Dinara and her team busy. Finally, finding a quiet moment to sit, she took the opportunity to go over the medical files of the colonists again. With the advent of colonisation, DNA engineering became highly popular. Colonies could engineer their population to thrive on their new planet and design personnel specific to their conditions. It was much easier to alter the population to suit the planet than terraform the complex ecosystems of their new planets to their own needs. The result was that, while the Alliance was technically made up of Earth colonies and their descendants, there was significant variation from the base human template. As humanity had encountered aliens in its spread across the galaxy, 
splicing in useful alien strains had become increasingly popular. Since the late 3500S, the Alliance had been making moves to limit the types of genetic changes that could be applied to ensure that Alliance planets could still interbreed. It all came down to the definition of human. The Verit males had a fascinating DNA structure, the base human DNA intertwined and spliced with a hodgepodge of alien and synthetic strands that somehow seemed to consolidate into an elegant whole. There were strains of a dozen alien predators. Together the elements resulted in a significant improvement in strength, stamina, increased acuity in all senses, and some fascinating changes in hormones, musculature and joints that she was unsure of the purpose of. This fascinating, deliberate adaptation was the reason that the clans of Verit were among the best warriors in the galaxy, hiring out as private armies and mercenaries. Danara was interrupted from her study by a gentle ping in her HUD, an icon flashing in her vision on the left, telling her that the Mammon would be raising to consciousness imminently. She hustled to the Iso Bay to the Mammon's side. The woman lay on the bed surrounded by a glittering net of sensors. Her pale, silver-white hair was a cloud around her head, and her slender, muscled body revealed by the plan white hospital gown. Maman, can you hear me? It is time to wake up. The maman opened her eyes, cloudy with sleep and confusion for a few seconds before they sharpened into icy blue recognition. Chief Healer, we are on the colony. Yes, maman. We arrived a few days ago. I've kept you in the stasis field until the worst has passed. The maman was overcome with a coughing fit, and Danara patiently held up a glass for her to sip before she could speak again. All is well? Mostly. Everyone landed safely. I understand there is some problem with the scanners, but everyone is hale and healthy. The maman nodded and raised a shaking arm to brush her hair back, scowling at her weakness. Give it an hour or so. I have applied derma nutrition packs and muscle stimulation, but your body will take some time to understand that it is awake again. The maman nodded. I have requested that Bilel and Skara attend you shortly. They will bring your clothing and anything else you wish. There is a shower through there. Your HUD has been reactivated. Danara motioned to the end of the med bay where the ablutions units were and handed the maman her silver earcuff. Thank you, healer, she hesitated. That is most kind. Danara heard the unspoken and unexpected. Danara was touched. Whatever she had expected from the maman, gratitude wasn't it. You are my patient, maman. Whatever else is going on, your health, safety and well-being is my priority when you are in my med bay. The maman snorted, which turned into another painful cough. A charming sentiment, suitable for a child. I hope you have not been conveying such nonsense to my charges. Danara grinned as she handed the maman a pouch of water to sip. Goddess forbid they learn compassion. The maman closed her eyes, fatigued by their interaction. Goddess forbid indeed, chief healer. Those young women will hold the reins of tens of thousands of trained killers. Compassion, weakness of any kind, will get them killed and unleash a torrent of destruction on the universe. Danara started, her eyebrows raising. You can't truly believe that. I've met your males. They are intelligent, reasoning, sentient beings. The maman studied her through slitted eyes. It has happened before. We will not allow it to happen again. It is our responsibility and penance for the changes we wrought in our children ages past. Iron control is the only way. This is as the goddess wills it. The last was said with an exhausted sigh, and Danara's heart went out to her even as she opened her mouth to disagree. Seeing her intention, the maman waved a hand weakly at her. Healer, fascinating as this discussion is, I do not have the energy to debate social politics with you right now. Her voice was caustic and Danara flushed in embarrassment. My apologies, Maman, that was highly unprofessional of me to raise the topic when you are my patient. The Maman nodded slightly. Rest now. I will let you know when the girls arrive. Healer? Yes. Thank you for not allowing any males in. Danara nodded. I will honour your request to the best of my ability. What about when I told you not to allow the Prime in, or to allow Odron to assess me? Danara was taken aback. The Maman was correct. She had applied her own cultural value judgments in contravention of the maman's express wishes. It was a deep breach of medical ethics. Again, maman, I find myself in the position of apologising to you. The maman sighed. You are too soft, healer. You must learn to stand your ground. Did you believe you were doing the right thing? 
that it was in my best interest and that of the colony, that I, as an individual, was causing myself or others harm. Danara hesitated for a moment before nodding gravely. Then stand your ground. Danara swallowed the words crowding up her throat. Rest, Maman. Danara exited the isobay to return to her desk, but stopped when she entered the consulting area. She couldn't put her finger on it, but something was different. She spun around in a slow circle, extending her senses out. Nothing appeared out of place, but there was the faintest sense of... something. Anger. Bitterness. Stealth. An emotional resonance that shouldn't be in a place of healing. Unable to detect anything but lingering traces, she took her seat again and waited for the Maman last to arrive, her every sense on high alert. When the girls finally barreled through the airlock, she was grateful for their bustling energy as they flitted into the ISO bay, arms full of clothing and cosmetics. Lucius grumbled under his breath as he half carried Peyton across the open green towards the med bay. This planet was a wicked bitch worthy of the mammals. Just before he stepped up onto the raised walkway, he brought himself and his cargo up short before he ran into Gadek Lenora, who was similarly assisting one of her young staff officers. Sighing at the anticipated wait, he eased Peyton down to sit on the ground, leaning against the wall. What happened to you? he inquired of Lenora. Helena here had some sort of vine wrapped around her hand. Before she could remove it, it broke a finger with its hydraulic constriction. You? Peyton stepped into a burrow of a local creature and wrenched his ankle. Lenora winced as she aided Helena inside the oculus door. Whole damn planet is out to get us, Lucius muttered as he settled himself down next to Peyton. Since the ships had landed a few days ago, it had been a never-ending parade of minor ailments, injuries and inconveniences. Verit males were not normally given to flights of fancy, but there were distinct mutterings that there was something on this planet that didn't want them here. It did not help that they were all pulling extra shifts to man the incomplete perimeter, the laser measuring painfully slow. And they still had not yet found the source of the scanning interference. Sharpening his already short temper to an edge, Lucius had also not yet had a moment to speak to Danara. Between extra shifts and all of the injuries, they had been ships passing in space. He had replayed the memory of their meal on the ship an embarrassing amount of times, analysing it for every nuance. Peyton shuffled, attempting to get more comfortable, and they sat companionably in the sunshine to wait their turn. After a lifetime on the freezing plains of Verit, or engaged in space warfare, simply sitting on a planet's surface enjoying the air was still a novelty. Lucius squinted at the ground cover on the green. He was fairly sure that he could see a darker, lusher circle of growth in the centre, where the Philosians had undertaken their incredible, astounding ritual. Warrior, may I ask you a question? Lucius turned to Peyton, taken aback by his formal tone. Peyton had been his second in command for the past two years, and they had formed a deep respect and friendship. Please do. Have you explored the dating concept with Danara yet? Peyton stared straight out at the courtyard, not meeting his eyes, and Lucius stiffened. This was not a conversation he wanted to have. Not yet, why? Peyton shuffled awkwardly. You should be aware that some of the others, they are starting to mutter that they will present themselves to her as potential mates. They saw you eating with her in public on the ship, then nothing these past days. They think she has rejected you. It is the only reason they can think of that you have not presented yourself. Lucius growled under his breath. Is there anyone in particular? Peyton finally looked at him. Lucius, there are several. She is both intelligent and lovely. You know the males will not stand by and risk missing the opportunity to allow her to choose them. Lucius huffed. I have been trying to give her time and space to acclimatise, and we have all been busy. She has not rejected me. You may tell the others that if she does, I will stand aside and allow them their opportunity, but not until then. Lucius bared his teeth in challenge. I am Warrior D. The first opportunity is mine. Peyton nodded again and relaxed. Verit males did not deal well with uncertainty. Eventually, Dinara came out of the oculus and waved them in. Peyton was taken into the depths of the medbay by Keenan, one of the nurses, to treat his ankle. Taking in Dinara's pallor and the dark circles under her eyes, Lucius bristled at her condition. How dare she fail to take better care of herself? He consciously moderated his ire, aware that anger against fatigue would only result in a negative outcome. Are you well, Dinara? 
It still felt incredibly intimate to say her name. Dinara dragged her hands through her hair, wearily pulling it down from her bun. We are exhausted. It has been an endless array of nonsense injuries, as well as completing the mammal's treatments. We have barely had any time to unpack or set up the permanent medical facilities because of all of the distractions. When did you last sleep? Dinara shrugged. I caught a few hours last night before I was awoken when one of the sentries injured themselves patrolling when there was a minor rock slide. He nodded. Patrolling physically in an unknown area in the dark was hazardous, and they were still mapping out routes. When did you last eat? I'm not sure. He cut her off before she could answer, his anger and concern at her condition bubbling over. Are you trying to do yourself harm? Her eyes flashed in response, her hands balling into fists. I am doing my job, Lucius, healing people. Injuries don't wait until it is convenient. And how will we fare if our senior healer runs herself into the ground? Don't be ridiculous. I pulled plenty of all-nighters in med school and during my residency. I won't die from a few days of fatigue. It's nothing that some sleep and some food won't fix. Lucius gave her an arrogant, condescending grin that set her teeth on edge. I see. And when will you get that? She grit her teeth in anger at him, and he was certain that she was resisting the urge to smack him on the side of his head. Don't do it, lady. You'll only hurt your hand. I've always been thick-skulled. Lucius had the insane desire to wrap her up in his arms and take her to his rooms. He wanted to tuck her into his bed and make her eat until her stomach groaned. He had never reacted so strongly to female distress before. Her entire being sang at him to protect her, take care of her. Dripping with disdain, Dinara's response should have singed the hairs off his balls. First warrior, if you'd stop interrogating me, I will go and eat momentarily. My shift is over, I am just waiting for Odrin to arrive. As if on cue, Odrin appeared through the airlock. Lucius refused to give her a chance to back out or become distracted by something else. Perfect timing. Come on. He grabbed her wrist to her annoyed squawk and started to pull her through the door. He stilled abruptly when the room went silent behind him and he felt the prick of a knife at his throat. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Bilel standing at his shoulder, her lartzi at his carotid artery. Its razor-sharp edge kissed his skin and he felt a trickle of warm blood run down into his collar. She hissed in fury. Release the healer at once, first warrior. You do not ever touch a female without her permission. I will have you stripped of rank for this. His stomach fell into his boots. Goddess, how had he made such a mistake? His affection for Dinara, their growing friendship, his unusual reactions muddling his mind, all of it had led him to treat her as one of his own, to care for her as he would a family member, if they were unwell or failing to look after themselves. He had forgotten for a split second that she was female. Had it been one of his own warriors that had committed such a stupid act, he would have blistered their hide for such a foolish, dangerous mistake. Males could never forget, even for a second, who held the power of life and death over them. Deliberately, he released his grip on Dinara's wrist and held up his hands. He could easily disarm Bailel, but he would never put his hands on a female in anger. He was consumed with regret at his actions, felt sick to his core. Oh, for the love of the goddess, put that damn thing away, Bailel. Why the hell do you have a knife out in my med bay? Dinara groaned. I am too tired for this shit. Put it down now. Bailel turned, confused, and Lucius watched a drop of his red blood fall onto the deck plate from the tip of her knife. He touched you without permission. It is against the law. Punishment is required. Dinara scoffed. Punishment, that's ridiculous, Odrin intervened. Hila Pasal, the Mamonla, is correct. It is against Verit law for a male to touch a female without her permission. There are some exceptions, such as for mates, children, emergency medical care or security duties, but they are rare. Dinara gaped in shock. Well, we are not on Verit here. This colony is governed by Colonial Alliance Charter, and there is nothing in it that says that a casual touch is illegal. He was not harming me in any way. He was attempting to take care of me. Lucius turned to her in surprise. Did she really believe that? Besides, I have touched Lucius without his explicit permission. Should I also be punished? Bailel snorted. Females are above such considerations. Females cannot harm men in the manner that males can harm females. Dinara took her time studying her. Her expression shuddered. I know you are young, but you cannot be that naive. I have read your history and I'm sure there are plenty of recent examples of females in your world that have harmed the males under their care. 
Bailel looked like she'd bitten a lemon, and Odrin and Lucius both inhaled sharply. Dinara raised her voice so that the entire medbay could hear. For the avoidance of doubt, Lucius has my permission to casually interact with my person. There is no punishment required. Thank you for trying to assist me, but it is not necessary. Dinara moved to join him at the door, hesitating before turning back to the audience that had assembled in medbay. I do want to be clear. Interaction including touching should always require explicit, enthusiastic consent. If I do not consent to a male touching me, I will make it very evident. Lucius, I think I'd like that food now. Deliberately she held out her hand, and he extended his arm for her to intertwine. He nodded, and fell into step with her as they exited the medbay onto the gantry, then down the single step to the grassed courtyard. When they had walked around the corner of the building, she murmured to him, Can they see us? No. She slammed her small hands into him, pushing him back under the shadowy overhang housing the mechanical fixtures. What the hell is wrong with you? Why would you do that? He went cold. She hadn't forgiven him for touching her. She was furious, magnificent in her anger. I am sorry I touched you, Dinara. I did not mean any disrespect. Not for touching me, you idiot. You would have stood there and let that angry child slice your neck open, for some stupid bloody reason. Don't pretend that you couldn't have stopped her. You are a fully trained warrior, and she's a fifteen-year-old with an attitude problem. Lucius couldn't have been more surprised if the goddess herself had appeared and danced naked before him. You... you are angry at me because I could have been hurt. Yes, Dinara growled at him, and pulled at her hair in frustration before something tugged at her senses. She spun back to him, feeling for his emotions. They were a whirling mass and she struggled to separate them from her own adrenaline and terror. She could still feel her panic when she realised that Lucius would just stand there passively and let Bailel slice into his artery. Slowly, as she sorted through the threads of his emotions, it dawned on her. You are surprised that I would care if you were harmed, that I would defend you. He nodded once, clenching his jaw to prevent him from saying something unwise. She moved closer, reaching up to his chin to pull his face towards her, her breath a whisper against his cheek, she asked softly, Why would you think such a thing? Lucius focused on a point over her shoulder, determined not to look at her. Females are important. They are the embodiment of the goddess, givers of life and the future of our world. Males are expendable and replaceable, she snorted. That is what the Mammon Council say. What do you think? He was silent. Dinara gently stroked his cheek with a fingertip, tracing the lines of his snarling canid tattoo. Is that what you think of me? That I see you as dispensable? That I see you as they see you? She asked softly. Lucius looked down at her, drowning in her honey eyes. It seemed for a moment that the world held its breath, before he surged forward to close the distance between them. She expected his kiss to be passionate, aggressive, like the emotions she could feel churning in his mind. Instead, it was tender, almost reverent. He cupped the back of her head in his hands, gently adjusting them until they achieved a perfect fit. She melted into it, teasing him with her tongue in tiny darts. Dinara snaked her arms around his neck and pressed herself against the length of him, encouraging him to kiss her deeper. With a groan, he wrapped his arms around her. Leaning back against the wall of the medbay, he ran his hands down her back to cup her ass, and he hauled her up to sit against him as she wrapped her legs around his hips. She moaned, his mouth stealing the sound, and he nipped his way down her throat to the zip of her suit. The door of the medbay hissed open. They froze, silently holding their breath as they heard Peyton murmur to another before heading off in the other direction. Dinara clamped her hand over her mouth to stifle a giggle, and they waited, frozen for long seconds, acutely aware that anyone walking past the medbay towards the colony admin facility would be able to see them between the buildings. Her eyes danced with delight, and Lucius grinned back at her, still holding her by her thighs at his waist, pressed against the building. Dinara, a becoming flushed pink, framed his face with her hands and spoke in a hushed whisper. Um, perhaps we should continue this another time. He considered, reluctant to lose their closeness before her stomach rumbled on cue. Another time, Healer. He had a lump in his throat reluctant to let this incredible experience end. He kissed her again softly, his question a breath against her lips. 
Would you let me get you some food, my lady? She nodded, delighted. Right now I would be honoured to eat with you, warrior, then I need at least eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. He examined her closely, noting her pallor and fatigue that even the flush of excitement from their kiss could not hide. Why don't you go back to your apartment, and I will bring you some food from the mess hall. Take a shower, I will be there in a few minutes. He pressed a gentle kiss to her temple before disentangling them. He watched as Dinara turned and trudged toward her apartment, making sure she was safely inside her unit before he headed to the mess. Dinara really was exhausted. She felt like she was dragging a whole shuttlecraft behind her. As the adrenaline of their incredible out-of-this-world kiss wore off, her fatigue swamped her. Like all the habitat units, her apartment had been dropped into position in the compound, and hers was in the top story of the Northern Habitat Group. She cursed under her breath at the goddess, space travel, stupid planets and the world in general as she slumped her way up the stairs to her room. Once there, she undressed and stood under the sonic shower until she finally felt clean. After, she dragged her sweats and tank on and opened her door expecting to see Lucius. Instead, there was a tray on the floor containing several plates with warming covers. Bringing it inside, she accessed her HUD to divert her calls to Odrin for her sleep shift, unless there was a code red emergency, and noticed there was a held message from Lucius. I thought you might need food and sleep more than my company for tonight. Enjoy the food and call me when you wake tomorrow. Perhaps we can take another lunch together. Dinara lifted the warming covers and found more of the ubiquitous vegetable stew, a chunk of bread and a large slice of spiced fruit tart. Smiling at his consideration, she tucked in. Chapter 8, A Call From Home Encrypted transmission from Agent Agrentau. Unable to remove Maman. Empathic senses of the Felotians are proving an obstacle. Colony 29 has discovered the diverted ammunition and catalyst supplies. They have requested resupply urgently. A remote control vessel has been dispatched to destroy the resupply ship in the Caphoid belt. Agent on ground continues to monitor. Moving to phase two. Dinara was dragged from her sleep by her HUD, beeping incessantly in her ear. Confused, she batted at it repeatedly until it silenced before she dragged herself over to the side of the bed to check the time on the wall clock. She had barely had five hours sleep, enough to be functional to keep going, but not enough to recover all her lost rest cycles. She snuggled back down into her covers again, when there came a loud banging at the door. All right, all right, she grumbled, as she drunkenly dragged herself up, cursing when she stood in the remnants of last night's dinner tray that she'd left on the floor beside the bed. She hopped to the small kitchenette sink and pushed her foot under the flow while she yelled at the unwelcome visitor. What's the problem? Can't this damn colony survive for a single shift without me? Once she had sufficiently washed the remnants of mushy vegetables off of her soul, she moved to the portal and grumpily mashed the door open button to reveal the wide expanse of Lucius's chest. He looked down at her and then down further, taking in her curves under her faded crop tee, and further still to her tanned legs in the shorts that she preferred to rest in. He opened his mouth to talk to her, but his brain came to a screeching halt. She was... adorable. All warm and sleep rumpled as she scrubbed at her face, the lines from the sheet still pressed into her skin. It was not a word that he typically associated with females. The maman learned their viciousness from birth, but it fit Dinara perfectly. She was adorable. Well, she repeated, Speak now. You have five seconds before I return to bed. Clearly, he thought, she is not a morning person. I'm sorry to wake you, Dinara. I know you have only had a few hours off duty, but the cadet has sent me to fetch you. There has been a development with the Mamonla's case, and as their guardian proxy, your presence is required. She huffed a sigh. It can't be that urgent. Why didn't they alert me on the HUD? You diverted it for everything but red alerts only, she nodded but he could tell that she wasn't really following yet, sleep clouding her eyes. So we used the cadet's authorization code to override it. Didn't you hear it ping? Dinara guiltily looked back at the HUD cuff she had removed on the bed. Ah, yes, I may have. Come on, get dressed and I'll get you a caffeine drink from Colony Admin. She nodded and turned to go back in. Dinara? Hmm? I like your sleeping gear. She turned back to him colour flaring in her cheeks and running down her neck to the tops of her breasts he could see jutting out of her crop. Oh, um, yeah, it's comfy, his grin widened. I like it very much. 
It is quite unlike what our own people wear to sleep. Dinara brightened with interest. Oh, what do you wear? He leaned in, smirking mischievously. Nothing. We rest as nature intended. Dinara gasped, brain instantly filled with images of a glorious golden naked Lucius. Hmm, perhaps lying on furs. Hang on. Furs. Dinara almost missed the twinkle in his eye, and she reached out to shove him. I wasn't born yesterday. Your planet is an ice house. You probably wear ten layers to go to sleep in summer. He laughed, capturing her hand against his chest, and she was instantly caught up his joy. She realised that it was the first time he had laughed freely with her. She immediately determined that she would make him laugh as often as possible. Hearing that booming laugh suddenly became a significant priority in her life. I'm sorry, Dinara, I couldn't resist. He nudged her inside again. Now go get ready and I will get you your caffeine drink, or the next time the Kidek will send a whole squad to fetch you. She nodded, still smiling, and went inside to get ready. Once she was dressed in her uniform jumpsuit, they double-timed it across the compound to the Kadek's office in the admin building. When they entered, the Kadek looked up from her desk and grimaced, You look like shit, Dinara. Thank you, Kadek. You look peachy, too. In truth, the Kadek looked terrible as well. The past few days had been wearing on all of them. The Kadek huffed a laugh at her acerbic comment. I'm sorry for waking you, but we cannot proceed without you. I promise to keep this brief, and then you can return to your rest cycle. Dinara nodded. What has happened? The Kadek looked pointedly at Lucius. That will be all, First Warrior. Thank you for fetching the Chief Healer. He turned smartly, turning to go, and briefly touched Dinara's elbow on the way out. I will bring you your caffeine drink and wait for you outside, Healer. The Kadek's eye lingered on their interaction. You two seem to be forming a bond. Kadek, if this is a gossip session about my love life, it can wait until I've had twelve hours of sleep and you can bring the wine and cheese. Goddess bless that we will have time for such things soon. I have finally heard back from the Alliance about your little Hellcats and their maman. The situation is a political mess, and everyone is running for the hills to keep their hands clean of it. We have a call with Sadai delegate Amira shortly, and we will then be joined by Maman Zaluda, their delegate to the Alliance. Dinara ran a hand through her hair and endeavoured to sit a little straighter. She really needed that caffeine now if she was going to face two of the most powerful females in the Alliance. The comm screen beeped, and the Kadek and Dinara turned to it. After a few moments, the Felotian logo of a crossed spear and a leaf over the pale blue goddess's hand appeared, before Delegate Amira's face filled the scene. Dinara concealed her shock. The Delegate's features were the Kadek's. They were twins, highly unusual in Felosian society. How had she not heard of two such high-ranking sisters? The delegate had the same aristocratic features and dark red skin, her silvered hair long and her physique visible on screen softer than the cadet's, but the similarity was unmistakable. Morale, healer, blessings of the goddess on you both in your new colony. Dinara bowed her head while the cadet scowled. Cut the shit, Amira. We have a few minutes before we meet with the maman. Brief us. Amira narrowed her eyes at her. Very well, sister. Essentially, the maman spoke true. In Verit, the maman take on fostered daughters for training, their maman la, and they become their guardians for the duration of their training. Legally, however, it is a tradition, not a deed of guardianship, so it is not recognised by the Alliance, and they never bothered having it registered legally because the maman so rarely travel. Practically, no one has ever bothered enforcing it until now, so they have precedent on their side. Aside from the legal guardianship issue, she also facilitated a stowaway, an interstellar crime. It's a mess. Dinara shuffled her tired bones in the chair, trying to get more comfortable. This wasn't going to be a short conversation. Amira continued. There are factions on both sides. As you know, back home the Lakar is new in her position. She desires improved interstellar relationships, but cannot appear weak so early in her tenure. Both the Kadek and Dinara nodded at that. The Lakar had only been in power a few years and the colony was one of her first major ventures. The ethical treatment groups were always uncomfortable with us entering into this agreement with Verit, given their historic breaches of Alliance sentient rights legislation. This has fueled the fire for them. You should hear them screeching about it. See, they kidnap children. Amira sighed dramatically. It has given me quite the headache. The cadet tapped her fingers in thought. All right. But what does the Lakar want us to do? 
Amira seems surprised at the question. The Lakar wants us to find a way out of this mess that allows the colony to continue, does not alienate the convocation, and which does not make us look weak. We cannot be run over, and we cannot stay silent on the legal issues. The cadet sat back in her chair. Right, easy then. Don't start with me, Morale. You weren't even on the damn planet before your colony created one of the largest diplomatic incidents in recent memory. Dinara frowned. With all due respect, Sadai, that is uncalled for. The cadet has handled this better than anyone else could have, given the situation. Amira turned her acid glare at Dinara for a moment, then cracked a smile. At least someone has your back there, sister. You are right, healer. I shudder to think what would have happened had morale not been there. The comm beeped discreetly, and a small timer appeared in the upper corner, signalling sixty seconds until the maman joined. Can you tell us anything about the maman joining? Zalud and I worked in concert to put the colony project together. She is heavily invested in its success and is an ally for the most part. She also has the ear of the matriarch. Whatever she says, we should take it as the direct view of the Mamon Ray. Like all Mamon, Zaludi is also ruthlessly intelligent and vicious when cornered. The cadet smiled grimly. Would that she had been appointed to this colony rather than that idiot Fry. Amira paled at that and leaned forward to convey her urgency to the Kadek. Fry Brune is many things, but she is not an idiot. She is the leader of one of the largest and most aggressive clans on Verit. If you think she's an idiot, then that is what she wants you to think. Do not underestimate her, ever. The timer beeped, indicating thirty seconds left. Didn't you read your pre-induction materials about their genetic engineering? The Kadek and Dinara exchanged a glance, and Dinara responded. They engineered their males for increased strength, vision, stamina, and hand-eye coordination. Amira tisked impatiently. Yes, yes, but did you read what they did to their females? The Kadek and Dinara exchanged glances again, confused, before Dinara answered hesitantly. Sadai, I designed the genetic program for this colony myself. I am 100% certain that there was nothing in the dossiers or the research on genetic enhancement of their female population, only their males. Amira shook her head. They engineered their females for intelligence. Their females lead every aspect of their planet, are genetically designed and trained from birth to do so. They are predators in every sense of the word. Their only goal is the protection of their world and propagation and survival of their species. Danara was stunned at the implications. An entire population had been engineered for war, split into leading and warrior classes through eugenics. She was also horrified that they had deliberately hidden it from the researchers planning this colony. Much of their medical knowledge was inaccurate. It also explained why the Maman had stolen the Environmental Adjustment Serum to re-engineer themselves and experienced such a strong adverse reaction to the treatment. The serum had not been effectively tailored to female Verit biology. They could not discuss further. The timer flashed orange and the screen split to show the delegate from Verit, Maman Zeluda. She was flawless, a princess carved from ice with a serene visage. Her pale violet eyes stood out in a carven face, her shockingly white hair held back by an ornate silver talk that appeared made from metal feathers, curving above her forehead and round to frame her face. She wore a dark purple velvet coat with a high, stiffened collar, embroidery in silver tracing the neck, down the front of the buttons and the cuffs. Despite her cool elegance, her eyes gave her away, her ruthless cunning. Amira smiled in welcome. Maman Zalude, thank you for making time to meet with us. May I introduce Kadek Maral Lien and Chief Healer Dinara Pasal, who has taken on guardianship of the Mamanla while we resolve this situation? Zalude bowed slightly, her eyes flicking between the Kadek and the Stai. The goddess has truly blessed your family, Amira, to have two such powerful daughters. Thank you, my friend. I hear that the goddess has also blessed your Maman Ray with a surprise fourth daughter. Zalude smirked then and Dinara realised that underneath the crystal façade she hid a wicked sense of humour. Indeed, it was quite a shock. No female and male pairing has birthed four daughters in the past three hundred years. The traditionalists almost had a collective apoplexy. Zalude turned her violet gaze to Dinara. Gila, Dinara, I thank you for taking temporary care of our lass. They are precious to us. They have reported to me that you have been most kind and solicitous of their health and well-being. Dinara responded with warmth. It is my pleasure. I have enjoyed learning about your people and find them to be bright young females. They have great potential and will be a credit to your race. 
It was my honour to care for two such young sisters. Zaludi nodded again before returning her gaze to Amira. Well then, Sadai, now that the formalities are over, what shall we do about this mess Frey has created? Amira smiled tightly. I'm glad you agree that this is Frey's mess at least. Zaluda sighed in exasperation. Yes. If she had asked permission to take her, lass, it would have been given. No one expects a mammon to leave her foster daughters behind. Amira frowned. One wonders why she did not request permission. Unless this was intentional, the thin edge of a wedge to drive between our cooperation. Zaludi shrugged, and Anara noted that she did not deny the suggestion. At any rate, we must deal with the situation. We agree that the stowaway fiasco is unacceptable, and agree to make reparations for that if you will grant forbearance on this ridiculous kidnapping accusation. Amira nodded, her eyes distant as she considered the implications. We agree. We can apportion blame to cultural misunderstanding, and use this as an example of how well we can accommodate our differences. It may end up being a positive for us. Both females gave tight smiles of approval, and Anara was horrified at how casually they spoke of ignoring legal charges and spinning the truth for political gain. Amira regarded Zaluda frankly. What reparations do you propose? We cede selection rights in its entirety to the second wave of colonists. The cadet sucked in a breath, and Dinara realised that she had missed something important. Amira was clearly stunned and chose her words carefully. I will be blunt, Zaludi. That is a significant concession well beyond the scope of this offence. What else do you want? Zaluda's face hardened. I personally wish for nothing more. However, you are correct that this concession comes with an additional condition, at the request of the matriarch herself. Amira waited, her face expressionless. We wish that Maman Frey remain on the colony. What? Absolutely not. Amira and the Kadek spoke over each other. Maman, Frey placed herself, the lives of my people and her own foster daughters, at risk. She is a highly disruptive influence that jeopardizes the success and cohesion of this colony. Zalude turned her crystal eyes on the Kadek. You do not seem shy or retiring, Kadek. I was on the selection committee for the colony management personnel. I have read your service record. I am quite sure that you can manage one mammal. After all, she does not even have a formal role in colony governance. She is a private citizen, subject to Alliance colony law, observing only. The cadet bristled. That is not the point. Dinara cut her off. Why? They all stopped talking. Why? Why is it so important that she stay? That you will give us what is apparently a significant concession? Zalud smiled at her like she was a child that had been unexpectedly bright. Finally, a sensible question. You do not need to know the answer, only that this is our requirement. Amira tapped her finger on the arm of her chair, considering. Very well, Maman. As you know, I cannot make this call myself. I will need to seek the Lakar's approval. We will discuss and come back to you shortly. They wrapped up the meeting with a few more polite formalities before the Maman exited the comm, leaving Amira and the colonists alone once more. Amira regarded Dinara. Your question is highly relevant, Gila. Fortunately, I know the answer. I am aware that the Maman Ray had to negotiate some delicate politics internally to get this colony approved. There is a strong faction, the Isolationists, that believe that the Verit culture and people are superior and are culturally contaminated by their interactions with other planets. They strongly opposed forming a joint colony, as you can imagine. Frey is a prominent leader in that faction. I suspect part of the deal to have this go through was having her appointed here. The Mamon Ray could well face a civil war if Frey was removed. The Kadek and Dinara exchanged glances, pondering the implications. Morale, this is your call. I can guarantee that the Lakar will support whatever decision we make, but ultimately you are the one that must deal with Frey on a daily basis. If you truly believe her a threat to the colony, then deport her and we'll manage the consequences. The Kadek's eyes softened. Thank you for your support, sister. Before you make your decision, I will offer one more incentive. If you keep Fry there, I will approve Varys for the next wave. The cadet was light-headed, could hear the blood rushing in her ears. That is not possible. Children are not scheduled for a decade more. The schedule can change, Moral tapped the desk sharply. That is nepotism of the highest order, bordering on corruption. 
Consider your position, sister. Healer, if Frey stays, we will release you from guardianship duties and return them to the Maman. However, you will remain their mentor and monitor their emotional and physical health. They both nodded. Now I have to go. I have three more crises to deal with before lunch. Amira, we have completed our stock take. As I suspected, there are other vital supplies missing. I will send you the inventory. We will need replacements immediately. How goes your investigation? It goes. That is all I can say for now. I will schedule a resupply ship immediately. Be well, sister. Healer. Amira logged off and the comm went dark. They sat in silence for a few moments, before Dinara reached over and ventured placing a hand on the cadet's shoulder. Are you all right, Mum? The cadet continued to stare off into space. Dinara could feel the tension singing in her bones. No, Healer, I am not sure I am. When no more was forthcoming, Dinara tried again. Who is Varys? Eventually the cadet looked at her. My granddaughter, she is five, her mother... Her mother is no longer with us and Amira travels as widely as I do, so she lives with our mother on Felosia. I see. So Amira has offered to have her brought here next year. The cadet nodded. Is this not a good thing? It is, but it is also difficult. She will be jumping the queue, which will cause bad feeling and is an abuse of power. Also, yes, she is half Svoboden. Danara inhaled sharply. Her ex-husband was Svobodan. She knew all too well how the females in the colony regarded the notorious species and how they themselves regarded females. The cadet continued, It is not common knowledge, but it is widely believed in political circles that the Svobodans are responsible for the current verit infertility, that they introduced a biological agent into their biome. I do not know if a half Svobodan would survive here. Dinara had no response, so she sat beside the cadet for long moments waiting for the older female to get her control back. Eventually, the Kadex stood. Thank you, Dinara, for your patience and care. Please keep this matter confidential for now. Dinara nodded. Absolutely, I will tell no one. Let me know when you have made your decision. She bowed and exited, the words an undercurrent of the meetings churning in her mind. As she exited the office, Lucius was waiting outside as promised with the offered caffeine drink. Lucius guided her to the open, grassed area next to the mess while she drank. As she sat on the prickly grass, she became increasingly aware that there were several people watching them unobtrusively. Lucius, why are all the Verit males watching us? Lucius looked uncomfortable. Are they? Yes, don't play dumb. Spill, what's going on? He sighed. He really didn't want to have this conversation, especially not before she had consumed her caffeine. She was prickly when awoken early. They are watching for a sign that you have accepted my courtship offer, or that you have rejected me and are therefore free for them to pursue. Dinara spluttered out her drink. What? While there are others that have found potential partners that may interest them, we are the first to have even discussed your dating. They look to us for guidance as to what follows next. Dinara wrinkled her nose. I'm not sure if I like that. It seems like a lot of pressure. Lucius shrugged. It is my responsibility to lead. Still, we do not need an audience. He glared at the Verit males nearby, and miraculously all seemed to find pressing duties elsewhere. I see. So you're only doing this to pave the way? How self-sacrificing of you. Exactly. I am a model of Verit leadership. They shared a laugh and fell into an easy silence, watching the wind ripple through the trees surrounding the plateau. Dinara could feel him studying her, sneaking glances, and eventually he turned to face her, sitting cross-legged on the grass. Dinara, I have investigated the meaning of ghosting. I wish to discuss this. Dinara was nonplussed. This was not where she had thought the conversation was going. Oh, go on. You thought we had a connection and were displeased when I did not continue our interactions in the same vein. You believed that I had engaged your emotions, then left. Is this correct? Ah, yeah, pretty much. But things have progressed somewhat since then. He cut her off. Does this mean that your feelings are... engaged? Are we doing the dating? Danara closed her mouth with an audible click. Staring into his blue eyes, she gave him the honest truth. No, we are not dating, not yet. We are getting to know one another. For me to reject or accept you, you'd have to actually ask me. Her playful tone belied her true feelings. This was what she had hoped to avoid... Relationships required vulnerability, and her last had scarred her deeply. 
the risk of rejection. Lucius did not try and pretend that he did not understand her reticence. Ask you on a date? She nodded. Gently, he reached over and loosely encircled her neck, his thumb stroking with maddening slowness. She was enraptured by the slight roughness of his calluses as he stroked, and the slow, feather-like touch in the hollow of her throat. Dinara, would you like to go on a date with me? She nodded a second time. Tell me. His voice held a note of command and she loved it, her face flushing. I wish no misunderstandings between us. I would love to go on a date with you, Lucius. Ever so slowly he leaned forward, giving her plenty of time to back away, and gave her the lightest of kisses. Their breath mingled and she said, Kisses usually come at the end of the date. I think on this planet we shall write our own rules, he replied, before moving his hand down around to the back of her neck and pulling her in closer. Just like that, they went up in flames, his tongue delving in and out of her mouth, stealing the tiny sounds she made. They kissed for an eternity before they broke apart, breathing heavily. I will plan the date. I understand it is traditionally a male responsibility. Dinara glowed, charmed at his first hesitant steps to reach out to a female. Thank you, that would be lovely. But for now you must sleep. You are not on shift for another twelve hours. Dinara rose to go and he grabbed her hand. You should know, Dinara, that my intention is courtship. I have researched the different forms of relationship on Felosia. I do not intend any short-term liaison. I did not volunteer for mating, but now that I have met you, I wish to explore where our liaison may take us. She watched the sun glint through his bronze metallic hair for a moment. Thank you for your honesty. In the interests of the same, I must tell you that I was also not looking for a permanent mate. We will take this slow. I have made mistakes with previous partners. I want this to be different, want us to get to know each other properly. I do not wish for another unsuitable mating. Honestly, I'm not sure that I want another mate at all. And you, you've never had the chance to find out what kind of female you truly want. He reached over and captured her hand in his, tugging her round to look at him. You doubt my interest and sincerity? Yes, she doubted. She continued to sense his churning emotions within, his interest was a bright, true flash of emotion, but underneath whirled a maelstrom that she could not penetrate. Still, she couldn't let him stew without trying to explain. It's not just that. We have a term, puppy love. It's from old earth. It refers to the first time you fall in love with someone. It is special and often fades rapidly. I don't want that for us, you understand? He nodded, and she realised that he still gripped her hand. Slowly he slid his hand down to her wrist, gently stroking over the fluttering pulse. Your heart races, he murmured. This is for me. She nodded. Lucius frowned, considering her words. You have been mated before. She nodded and went to pull back her wrist, uncertain how he would react. He shackled her wrist with utmost gentleness but resisted her retreat. I don't wish to speak of it. It was not a pleasant experience for me. Does it bother you? He nodded and she felt her heart fall. It bothers me that a male did not see your worth or treat you as you deserve. It hurts me to see you sad. It does not bother me that you have mated before. It is a female prerogative to mate as she pleases. Do you believe me? Dinara nodded, unable to speak. Lucia studied her beautiful face, the curve of her cheek and the slight curls escaping from her hair coil on her head. I will take this slowly as you command, my lady. But I doubt this small canine love. Verit males are not the fickle versions you have met elsewhere. We spend our lives in the hope that we will be honoured with a chance to find a mate to cherish. When we decide, we decide. Perhaps Felotian females will need time to believe this truth. He smiled a wicked smile and she felt a rush of heat. I am sure that we will find this dating enjoyable. Her jaw hardened and he saw the shadows in her eyes. He instantly resolved to investigate her previous mate. Dinara spoke in a hushed whisper. I came here to continue my research. She softened and stroked his cheek down to his jawline. But then again, my imagination could never have dreamed up you. I acknowledge your intention, Lucius, but make no promises. I make my own decisions. He nodded and bowed his head to her. As the goddess wills it, always healer. Chapter 9. Picnic. Lucius spent several nights undertaking research on the topic of Philosian dating. There seemed to be many rules regarding an appropriate initial date. He hit a snag when he realised that most of them required attending some sort of establishment for recreation or dining. 
At this early stage of the colony, there was limited entertainment, and the only dining available was the communal mess. Eventually, he elected to enlist the aid of someone he felt he could trust. While he wanted to talk about his romantic intentions for the healer, about as much as he wanted to eat glass or confront a raging bull whale, he was forced to accept that he needed to seek expert assistance. He walked into the security office before the beginning of his next shift and was pleased to find an opportunity presented so early. Sraya was coming off her own shift, standing before her desk logging her reports. The security office was a utilitarian space and in contrast to the rest of the Ardrak, the overwhelming impression was of greyness. The main area had several grey desks spread out in a large open room, each bolted to the grey deck pates. The wall to the left featured a single large window that broke up the reinforced grey walls with a view of the landing field. The back wall had a series of doors, one with a heavy-duty security panel next to it, leading to the armoury, and another couple on the right leading to the security storage lockers and cells. Gadek Sraya, he greeted her warmly. He had come to appreciate the Felosian officer in their first weeks working together. He found her intelligent, insightful and hard-working. He had never had a female friend before, but had begun to think that in time, Sreya and he could become friends. It was a strange thought. Good morning, Lucius. How are you? Well, thank you. I wish to discuss something with you. At his serious tone, she glanced up from her reports. How may I be of assistance? He shuffled awkwardly for a moment unsure of how to broach the subject, leading him to just blurt it out. I wish to discuss the subject of dating. She slowly placed her tablet on the desk and turned to face him. Dating? Her voice was carefully neutral. Yes. Where would you suggest as an appropriate first date on this planet? She stared at him nonplussed as he continued. I have considered the mess hall, however, that does not seem special enough. She cleared her throat to interrupt him. First warrior, are you sure you wish to discuss this with me? He was taken aback. Yes, you are a sensible female and I have come to value your insight and advice. She exhaled in a rush. My insight and advice. So you aren't asking me on a date? Lucius looked shocked. Of course not, we work together, it would be entirely inappropriate. Sreya sagged with relief. Thank the goddess. I was trying to come up with polite ways to tell you that I'm not interested. Dinara is my friend and I know that there is something going on between you two. Sreya rambled on. Also, not that you aren't handsome, sir, but I am already in a committed life pairing with specialist Kirili. We intend to find a male mate that we can both appreciate, and her tastes lie in other directions. Lucius was completely flawed, and Sreya laughed at his stunned expression. You didn't know? It is common on Felosia. Surely, with a lack of females, some of your males also find companionship with other males. Lucius cleared his throat, his mouth suddenly dry. Well, yes, many males form close bonds together to raise the young males of the clan. It had just never occurred to me that two females would do so as well. He paused. Have you made any other males aware of this? She considered, tapping her finger gently against her chin in thought. I don't know. It's not a secret. Many of the females know but it's not unusual for Felosia, so no one would necessarily have mentioned it. Lucius nodded in understanding. I would advise that you discuss this with Specialist Kirili before you reveal this. There are many males that would fall over themselves at the opportunity to have two female mates. It would increase a male's social standing significantly. You will want to be sure that their affections are sincere. Clearly grateful that they were on safe ground, Sraya ventured a pat on his shoulder. Thank you for your insight. Now, Dinara, you've finally asked her on a date. He nodded. That's wonderful. I'm pleased to know that you support my intentions. I have reviewed the available materials on Felotian dating, and the ceremonies for the initial stages of courtship seem to revolve around attending dining or recreational establishments, which we have in short supply at the moment. I seek your advice on an appropriate interaction for our first courtship event. Sreya grinned widely. It would be my pleasure, Lucius. Dinara knew something was up the moment she left her quarters. Odrin winked at her as she passed him entering the administration building, and she was sure that she saw Zira dip abruptly into a storeroom when she saw her coming. When she passed Fila as she entered the medbay, Fila mouthed, Good luck, before blowing her an air kiss. Thus, she was not entirely surprised when Lucius arrived just after her morning shift had started. 
There were no secrets in a small colony. It was worse than living in dorms at university. She was sitting at the little round table in the consulting area, sipping a warm drink and going through the morning schedule. She was astounded, however, when he appeared and thrust the large clump of violet blooms at her. They were quite beautiful, if somewhat bedraggled from being held in his hands. He had been confused about the significance of gifting flora that could not be eaten or replanted, but Sreya had assured him that it would be well received. Eventually deciding that it must contain a symbolism he did not need to understand, he had followed her instructions to the letter and was rewarded by Dinara's dazzling smile. He resisted the urge to kiss it, to taste her joy, demand she shower him in her warmth. Sreya had not guided him astray. Lucius, this is lovely, thank you. She turned and placed them into the small sink in the kitchenette of the consulting room, her gentle touch lingering on the dark petals as she arranged them. I am glad you like them. He slowly stepped into her space and took her hands. Dinara Pasal, in accordance with the traditions of your people, I have scheduled our initial date. I would be grateful if you would attend an evening of dining outside, referred to in Felosia as a picnic, at 1900 hours this evening. Touched by his formality, she smiled up at him, dimples showing. Thank you, Lucius, that would be lovely. She rose on tiptoe to press a sweet kiss against his stubbled jaw. His eyes widened in shock for a second before he relaxed his tense stance. Truly? You will attend? She laughed lightly. Yes, of course. I said that I would be happy to go on a date with you. Why are you surprised that I said yes? He didn't reply for a long moment, his brow furrowed. Truly, I do not know. It is an anxiety-inducing process, this date-asking. On Verit, the Mamon commands the male she wishes to mate with to attend her. There is no uncertainty about acceptance. Dinara cocked her head and asked, What if the male does not wish to go? Lucius shrugged. Her ladyship commands as the goddess wills it. I see. Dinara felt a wave of compassion for the Verit males, trying to pave their way for their brothers into the unknown. Well, I thank you for the effort you have gone to in researching Felosian customs. It is very sweet. Sweet. The words refer to flavouring, but your context implies a positive value judgement. It is good, this sweet. She smiled again and nodded. It is good, he nodded firmly. I shall see you at 1900 hours. Lucius exited the med bay and moved towards the rec centre and the training gymnasium. He was due to lead his team through hand-to-hand -hand combat drills. As he stepped inside, he was taken aback by the gaggle of people waiting for him, all who had fallen silent at his entrance. He was surprised to see several of the Felotian officers as well as his males. Well? Fila pushed through. Get out of the way, you idiot. She shoved poor Broken Day out of her path with a sharp elbow as he raised his arms in surrender. What did she say? They paused expectantly. How did you know it was today? He replied. Tadekli snorted and rolled her eyes. Hello, security officer here. Plus, you left the perimeter early this morning and returned with a large bunch of native flora. It wasn't a hard deduction. Nice touch, by the way, Fila interjected, and the other Felosians muttered in agreement. But what did she say? Lucia smiled smugly. She said yes. She agreed to dine with me tonight at the picnic. There was a silence for a moment before the group erupted in whoops. Calm down or someone will hear you, he hissed. What do you mean, someone? Everyone wants to know. We're all told to come and bring the gossip back to our assigned areas. Fila laughed and clapped her hands. First dates are so exciting. The females exited chattering, leaving Lucius, Broken, Tarlac and Peyton staring after them incredulously. They are truly terrifying, Broken whispered, still nursing his smarting ribs. Dinara was finishing up in the med bay when the mamon appeared. The healer was somewhat frazzled and looking forward to finishing and getting ready for her date. The day had been a parade of excited and affectionately nosy people. She had been graced with advice from the Felotians, the butt of jokes from the med staff, and the recipient of some stilted but genuine questions from some of the Verit males interested in scheduling similar nights of their own. It was lovely, all of the support, and it made her want to hide in her quarters with a blanket over her head. Of all the people that would visit her, she had least expected the maman. Since Fry's discharge from Medbay, she had studiously avoided Dinara's presence. Dinara noted that while Fry was finally wearing an AI jumpsuit, it was a custom pale gold edition, clearly not standard issue, embroidered in glittering AI smart thread. 
Over her jumpsuit she wore a heavy, open, sleeveless white jacket, with a stiff high collar, and more glittering embroidery with images of fierce Dathalka trailing down the front and the hem. Her white hair shimmered with dusted gold powder and was swept into a complex braid, topped with a gold and platinum diadem. It was stunning and entirely impractical for rough colony living. She shone like a faceted diamond. Can I help you, Maman? Are you feeling unwell? Frey's response was stilted. Yes, Hela, I have a fever. I require your assistance. Dinara directed Frey to one of the ISO bays. Of course, come in, please. Please lie down on the bed and I will commence a scan. It will take a few moments. Thank you. The maman complied, and as Dinara moved around the room setting up the scan, she could feel the maman's eyes on her. Bailel tells me that you and the first warrior have your first mating interaction this evening. This is an encouraging step towards mating for the colony. Yeah, Fry was the last person she wanted to discuss this with. Still, she had to be polite. Well, yes, it is a social interaction we refer to as dating, sometimes a prelude to mating. It is an opportunity for us to get to know each other away from the camp. The maman furrowed her brow. Is there something wrong, maman? Frey's frown deepened. It seems foolish to go away from the camp with the warrior if you do not already know him. You should never let the male pick the battlefield. Dinara laughed as she commenced the scan. I do not fear for my safety with Lucius. I know that he would never harm me. It is not a battle, it is a date. Frey tisked at her. The Mammon Lass have informed me that you have had several eating engagements with him. What more can you need to know to mate him? Just command him and have done with it. Dinara snorted. You are moving several steps ahead in the dance, Maman. I am nowhere near considering mating. I like Lucius and wish to know him more. And frankly, our mating is none of your business. The scan beeped its completion, and Dinara turned her attention back to the screen as the Maman sat up to look at her. You are mistaken, Chief Healer. The Convocation has approved this colony to save our declining population. Every mating on this colony is my business. No priority is more important. Dinara regarded the Maman and was taken aback at the fervent glint in her eye. You aren't unwell, are you, Maman? Your scan is clear. Please do me the respect of dropping the pretense and say whatever it is you want to say. The Maman stood and resettled her wrap around her. Very well. The males of Verit are not like other males. We love them and care for them, but they are dangerous, more than you know. The reverence that our males have for females cannot change. It has kept our society stable for generations. People do not revere the commonplace. Distance, formality, ritual, these things protect us all. Dinara opened her mouth to disagree, but Frey continued. You are an intelligent female healer. Surely you can see how these casual interactions are dangerous. You would do well to avail yourself of my guidance. That was quite enough for Dinara. No, Maman, I don't see. Mating may be a primary part of your role on Verit, but I do not report to you. I am not a child. I have no need or desire for your supervision. Frey hissed at her. These casual interactions, allowing him to interact with your person freely, it will create a familiarity and casualness that can only lead to danger. Dinara attempted to quell her rising anger and listen. She could sense the well of fear within the Maman. She spoke deliberately and gently, trying to reach the older woman. The males are not vicious animals, they are intelligent beings. If we cannot trust the males, then this colony is over before it has begun. Trust is the building block of successful relationships, and no male can trust what he fears. The mammal snarled viciously, the sound reverberating around the room. Your goddess damned soft heart will end up getting someone killed. You have no idea what you are dealing with. She spun around, pointing at Dinara with a vicious stab of her finger. I had thought to assist you after your kindness to me, but it seems you are determined to run towards your own destruction. I will not let you drag my males with you. Dinara took a step back from the maman's unexpected anger and reached down to touch the laser scalpel on her belt, assuring herself it was there. We are done here. You are not unwell. Please leave my med bay. The maman flushed with fury before drawing herself up and stilling wrapping her anger around her, turning cold. Dinara could not believe the speed with which the other female corralled her emotions, her face becoming an expressionless mask. Who was the real maman, she wondered, the angry, passionate female protecting her males, or this icy, ruthless predator now before her that was capable of anything? As the maman turned to exit, 
She threw a final barb over her shoulder. Have a care, healer. You may not report to me, but Lucius does. Danara's blood ran hot with rage, her head pounding with anger and fear for Lucius. Do not threaten us, Frey, Danara shot back. The mammon raked her with a final contemptuous glance as she walked away. Watching after her until she left, Danara doubled over, gulping in air as she tried to calm her racing heart. Not the best prelude to a first date. Her HUD beeped her half-hour warning, and she cursed and turned to leave. She had half an hour to get ready, and she was shaking with adrenaline. For a moment she considered cancelling the date, but she was furious at the thought of letting the maman win. Resolving to put it behind her, at least for tonight, she waved at Audrin on the way out and raced to her quarters, taking the stairs two at a time. As she breezed in the door, she stripped off her blue jumpsuit and threw it into the cleanser while she jumped into the sonic shower. As soon as she was clean, she plopped herself down on her bed and scrabbled through her meagre collection of cosmetics before slapping some colour on her eyes and lips. At ten minutes before she was scheduled to meet Lucius, the cleanser buzzed and she retrieved her jumpsuit. For a moment she felt a pang of regret at her attire. Not too long ago she had had closets of gowns that she wore to state functions with her husband. Ah well, even if she'd had them, she wouldn't have been able to wear them. Until they got the scans working properly and could secure the nearby area, everyone was required to wear their jumpsuits so that command could monitor their health in case of incident. At one minute to go, she turned to examine herself in the full-length mirror on the back of her door. She took her hair down from her bun and fluffed it out. Not bad, not bad at all. Lucius buzzed at promptly 1900. Not that she would expect anything else. When she opened the door, his eyes travelled from her eyes down, caressing her curves with his gaze in open admiration. Dinara, you look lovely. He reached a hand out and gripped her chin gently, turning her face to the side. You have applied colour to your skin. This is a Philosian custom. Is it a dating ritual paint? Indeed it is, although it is often worn at other special events. It is lovely. The colours enhance the gold of your eyes. Thank you. Lucius held up a small day pack. I have food and drink for us and have selected a location that I think you will enjoy, shall we? He hefted the small pack with an easy strength that made her want to run her hands all over his muscled frame. He gestured for her to step outside, and they ambled companionably down the stairs and across the compound to exit towards the river valley. The air was cool in the early evening, and the sky was a stunning lilac. Mercifully, they managed to avoid most people, although she saw one of the sentries give Lucius a knowing wink. As they exited the inner perimeter, they moved out into the dappled light of the trees. The violet suns were setting, and the evening was cool as Lucius led them down a moss path. Where are we going? Dinara asked. He turned and flashed her a smile. You'll see. Are you always this patient? She snorted. I've asked exactly once. I'm walking into an unexplored forest on an alien planet, on a first date with a male I barely know. Females that don't ask questions end up as those have you seen this being. Bulletins on the interstellar news. He cocked a sardonic eyebrow at her. What if I was taking you into the dark forest to have my way with you? She snickered. I have a laser scalpel and I'm not afraid to use it. He laughed, a deep warm sound, and he reached over to grasp her hand. They moved quietly through the forest, aware of the buzz of wildlife around them. Danara could see flashes of colour as native birds flitted by, and heard rustling as unseen creatures moved through the undergrowth. The further they moved into the lush lilac and green, the more she felt the weight lift off of her. Her heart squeezed in joy as they wandered for ten minutes before they emerged from the tree cover to a stunning lookout. Danara was spellbound as she gazed down the valley to the rapidly moving river far below them, painted in hues of pink, violet and pale green in the twilight. Oh, Lucius, this is gorgeous. When did you find it? One of the late night patrols. There are some perks to running security the old-fashioned way. He dropped to one knee and took his pack off, placing it on the ground to unpack. He withdrew a silver thermal blanket which he spread on the spongy lilac moss and then proceeded to pull out a thermos and several small packages of foodstuffs. Before hanging a couple of small solar lanterns above the blanket, he poured her a drink from the thermos and crossed to stand next to her at the lookout. Are there many places like this in Felosia? She accepted the mug with a smile and nodded. Felosia is a warm climate with black sand beaches and pink skies. A large portion of the planet is covered in lakes, rivers and oceans. 
this almost feels like home. She took a sip and sighed. It was a tart alcohol with a sweet aftertaste. Its warmth flowed through her like sunshine in her blood. She leaned into Lucius and relaxed. What about Verit? Lucius shook his head. Verit is frozen most of the year, and our cities are largely underground. The ice plains are stunning and you'd be surprised at how beautiful it is below. There are huge geothermal pools illuminated by bioluminescent algae, fields of feathered fungi that are so soft you can fall asleep on them. It sounds beautiful. She took another sip of the drink. This is lovely. It is a fermented fruit drink, a batch made by brothers. We make it to warm the insides. He smiled lopsidedly at her. And warm the brain, she laughed again. Perhaps I can visit Verit someday. He shook his head. Offworlders are not welcome on Verit. There is an occasional diplomat, but that's it. The maman fear that we will be contaminated by off-world ideas. The last was said with unhidden bitterness. Dinara moved to sit on the blanket to watch the sun set over the valley. New ideas are not to be feared. They are how societies evolve. The maman have no wish for us to evolve. Yet you are here, on another planet, mixing with dangerous Philosians with our strange ideas. She nudged his foot with hers. Perhaps I will corrupt you, tempt you into rebellion. She turned to him laughing but was taken aback at his shuttered expression. You must never joke of rebellion against the Mammon, not even in private, Dinara. You have no idea what they are like, the lengths they will go to, to protect their way of life. They always have a plan, always have leverage. She cocked her head, studying both his expression and emotional resonance before she asked softly, And what leverage do they have over you, Lucius? What has you so afraid you bottle your spirit up within? She reached out to place a hand on his throat, trailing down to rest over his heart. He clenched his jaw so hard, she worried he might hurt himself, the tendons standing straight out in his neck. He turned away, shrugged her off, and she decided not to push for the moment. Long moments later, she was about to suggest a return to the campsite, when he spoke. He didn't look at her, just stared out at the rapidly darkening landscape. I have six brothers, all younger. It is common practice in Verit to foster brothers with different families, different maman, as insurance against their brother's behaviour. It also provides the clans with an opportunity to share skills, and if a male is lucky enough to be selected, mix gene pools. Before I came here, I was notified that my youngest brothers have been honoured by being fostered by the matriarch herself. Dinara nodded. Why are you so angry, then? If this is normal, an honour... He turned again and she saw frustration in his eyes, and she realised that he wanted to tell her, but was bound in some way to prevent it. She reached out again, a gentle stroke on his shoulder. It's all right, Lucius, I won't push. You may tell me or not in your own time. After a long moment, he nodded and turned back to the view. Without looking at her, he reached up and placed his hand over hers. They sat that way, quietly watching the setting suns, allowing the cool breeze to blow away the tension between them. Would you like to see a trick? He blinked in surprise. What? A trick? Something that Felotians don't often show outsiders. Not waiting for his reply, she stood up and walked to a nearby bush that bore large buds. I have been analysing some of the flora that the bioteams have been bringing in, and if I'm not mistaken, this is a fruiting plant. She reached her hands out to cut one of the buds and bent to place her lips next to it, whispering, bathing the bud in her breath. Lucius moved next to her, staring in rapt interest. He reminded her again of a huge jungle cat, eyes bright with curiosity. A few moments passed and she opened her hands to show a peach-coloured fruit covered in fuzzy blue hairs. She plucked the fruit, pulled her laser knife out, and sliced a section away to reveal the dark blue pearls within. Lucius leaned in to sniff, his eyes flicking to hers at the sweet smell. Go on, it's perfectly edible. They will start appearing on our normal food rotation soon, now that we've confirmed they are suitable for our digestion. He took the offered fruit and scooped out some of the pearls, dropping them into his mouth and popping them with his teeth. As he did, his mouth was flooded with a sweet, slightly spicy juice. I suspect they will be very popular. This would make an excellent fermented spirit, Dinara laughed. I will start mixing hangover cures. How did you do that? Dinara smiled archly. I said I'd show you a trick, not that I'd show you how I did it. You can't expect me to show you all my secrets at once. Lucius nodded seriously. Fair enough. Hungry? 
They returned to the blanket and began dividing the small packs of dried meat, vegetables, cheeses, and added Dinara's fruit to the fruit Lucius had brought. They ate their picnic and watched the stars emerge. After a while, Lucius lay down on the blanket, the night a glittering blanket drawing across the sky. Dinara snuggled up against him, enjoying the warmth he gave off. It was like lying next to a radiator. They watched the stars appear one by one, her hand gently resting on his chest and her head in the crook of his arm. Slowly they began to share stories as they fed each other snacks. He played gently with her hair as he told her of running wild with his brothers over the ice flows of home. She laughed when he described dunking his elder brother in an ice pool, and she shared stories in turn of her surfing with her sister on the black sand beaches of Philosia. It seemed only natural for her to raise herself up on her elbow until she was half lying on top of him, his hands continuing to stroke the silk waves of her hair. When his lips lifted up at the corner to laugh as she described her sister's antics, she gave in to her desire to kiss him. His other hand came around her to press against her lower black, flexing gently, while he let her explore with sweet kisses, his pupils dilating with pleasure at her gentle caresses. Gradually the sweet kisses became more passionate. He nuzzled into her neck, and she was startled to feel a purring from deep within his chest. What is that? He looked at her through half-slitted eyes, and without answering, he leaned forward to bite at her neck gently, sending a shiver of anticipation down her spine. He grinned wickedly. You'll find out. Good goddess the male was hot, she thought as she stared down at him. He bestowed long suckling kisses down the curve of her neck and twined his hands in her hair, and after a while she had no more coherent thoughts, as she let herself be carried away in a cloud of passion. Afterwards they lay together on the blanket, sweat-slicked skin cooling in the air. Donara was soft and languid, sated and relaxed in a way she hadn't been in a very long time. That was incredible, thank you. She yawned and he moved to cover her with her jumpsuit. This night was for you, my gift, in thanks for agreeing to come into the dark forest with me. He mock frowned at her. I don't need your thanks. He chuckled, tapping her nose in reprimand. It was not a favour. I enjoy pleasing you. Reluctantly she nodded and he pulled her closer, noting with satisfaction the red marks of passion left from his kisses. The other males would know that she had accepted his courtship. So some feline DNA? she asked. Lucius looked at her and she could sense his uncertainty. It's all right, I like it. Your purring feels nice when we are pressed together. She paused for a moment. And everything looks like it will fit. I was a bit worried about possible differences in alien biology there for a bit. Lucius barked out a laugh. Donara continued to surprise him. He couldn't believe that she had allowed him to bring her such pleasure, or that she'd not demanded, just followed where he had led. He was floored by her sweetness, her joy at his presence. Every time he looked at her, his heart thudded and his throat tightened. He was falling for her far too fast, and his mind screamed at him to keep some distance, to protect himself and his brothers. He swallowed the fear deliberately, refusing to let it steal the beauty of their first night together. The evening was magical, and easily the most romantic time of Donara's life. They stayed on the cliffside lookout, feeding each other titbits, snuggling and occasionally kissing, enjoying the view into the evening, until the cool air had turned cold. Lucius walked her back to her unit hand in hand. When they reached her quarters, she paused outside the door. Thank you for your company, Donara. It was most enjoyable. I think I could come to like your custom of dating. Donara sniggered. He was absolutely adorable in his formality. Thank you, Lucius. I had a lovely time. Lucius leaned in, tipping her chin up to him, giving her plenty of time to pull back before skimming the gentlest of kisses across her lips. She tasted of the sweet, tart drink. He gently sipped at her full lips before deepening the kiss to nibble on her lower lip. Donara was breathing heavily by the time they had finished. He pulled back to smile wickedly at her before stepping away. Sleep well, healer. He tapped her on her nose again, bowed briefly and sauntered off, pleased with himself as she stood there with her mouth hanging open in shock, staring after him before she chuckled at his sheer audacity. Damned warrior certainly had some style about him. All in all, it was a very good first date.